honor to God, who is the head of my life, the creator and sustainer of the heavens and the earth. I count it a blessing to be counted one amongst the living and not amongst the dead. It is good to be home tonight in Zion Church. Amen? Amen. It's good to be home amongst friends and loved ones. I won't be long before you this evening. I have not been feeling well today. I have not been feeling well for a while. But God is good. All the time. God is good every day. I want to share with you this evening a few words. I want to share with you, my family, what the Lord has placed on my heart. You see, no man knows the hour. No man knows the day that the Lord will require him to come home. That is why we are told in scripture and in song and encouraged in our everyday life to be ever vigilant, to get our house in order. We are encouraged to do the work while it is yet light, because no workman can do the work when darkness comes. I want you all to know <laughs> that I love you. I love you, and I love this church. We have had our ups and downs, amen? amen. We have had our good times and trying times, our differences, and our disagreements. But that family is what families do. But in Christ, we have come together. And with Christ, we will find a way to stay together. Because we are brothers and sisters by the sacrificed blood of our risen Savior. I remember what seems so long ago now, but it has been less than 10 years. I was called upon to preach the sermon of Father Thomas Henson of Binghamton, New York. If memory serves me correctly, it was in October of 1863. It was during the dark days of that war, which would eventually bring to fruition in the efforts of so many of our abolitionist brothers and sisters, the end of chattel slavery in America. Many of you in attendance this evening may recall when that war began. I could not, I would not support it. When the Great War first commenced, nowhere was it indicated by our beloved president. Wait. May God continue to bless his soul and his legacy. <laughs> nowhere did he publicly state that my colored brethren in the South would be free by that war. Therefore, I concluded that if this war was fought and won by the North, without the end result being the freedom of my enslaved kinsmen, their condition after the war would be no better than, than their condition before the war, and perhaps in some ways, even worse. But we worship a God who sits high and looks low, a God who allows man to plan, and then overrides those plans with his will being done on earth 
as it is in heaven. So when President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863, I could then join my friend and co-laborer Frederick Douglass. And I could join those others in rounding up and in, in bringing together those who would fight the black men and youth who would fight for the North of that war. So it was in October 1863. I was called upon to preach the funeral of my friend, Brother Henson. Father Henson was aged at his death. And no one, not even his blind wife, knew his age. He had escaped slavery from Maryland and had left several children in that state, still slaves. And he had hoped that in some way, through that war, they would find their freedom. I said of Father Henson in my sermon that he was a faithful trustee of the church and a steward to preach. I said that he was a class leader and a member of the Sabbath school at the church. I said that in all of his relations with the members of his church and his community, he had made a bright and glorious mark with his fellow man as an exemplary Christian. I pointed out to those in attendance that day that Brother Henson may, he may have had faults but since his coming to live with us in Binghamton, none that I knew could bring aught against him. <laughs> that in his manly deportment and straightforward course under persecution, his deep interest in the welfare of his people, and most especially the education of the youth, it made him beloved and respected by all who knew him. I remember stating that his life was the best lesson that any of us could teach as how to die as happy Christians. How to die as happy Christians. I had no reservations that evening in choosing for the title for my remarks. I find no fault in him. Referencing John, the 19th chapter, and the fourth verse. Our Savior had been brought before Pontius Pilate. I'm feeling better now, church. I'm feeling better. And, and after having Jesus scourged, Pontius Pilate had told the Jews who had wanted him, sacrifice. I find no fault in him. <laughs> Father Henson's blind widowed wife told me that she rejoiced when she looked over her husband's wife. She said that he had left her a beautiful book to read in her blindness. She said that her book of remembrances of her husband was sweet. I told those in attendance that day that Father Henson had written a book I told them that even though he himself was unlearned and unlettered, he had written a book. I reminded each and every one in attendance that day, as I remind each and every one of you under the sound of my voice this evening, that we are each writing a book. We are writing a book of our lives, whether we will to do it or not. We should each take care to write in that book that which will be pleasing and pleasant before our God. That sermon and Father Henson have been on my mind since I rose this morning. You see, as I look back over my life, I have begun to wonder what type of book have you written, Reverend Logan? I have begun to question myself when I stand before the Lord and Savior on that great getting up moment. And I ask, and I am asked, what did I do with the time that I was given? What did I do with the talents 
than I was given? What did I accomplish to leave this world better than I found it? How shall I answer? What shall I say? I, with the help of my friend and fellow laborer for justice, John Thomas, put out a book back in 59. With Brother Thomas' support and guidance, we produced a book of over 400 pages. With the proceeds from the sale of that book, our work in helping fugitives with food, with food, clothing, and shelter for support. Our narrative of a real life, my life, told my story from my birth to September of 1851, the Jerry rescue. And up until my return to Syracuse from St. Karen, St. Catherine, in the spring of 1852. Because of my role in the freeing of Jerry Henry, I was imposed upon by my family and friends to seek refuge in Canada. I told them then, and I tell you today, that it shocked my manhood to have ran in the first place. John Thomas and I had planned on another book, a book to be written when my public career had ended. But the Lord called my friend home to be with him in April of 1866. So the book we would have written together will now never be written at all. When I look back over my life, I can recall some incidences that I was involved in that some may say were important. When we, the concerned citizens of this great city, decided that our fellow citizen Jerry would not be taken back into slavery and freed him from the clutches of despots, and man speak. When I traveled with John Brown to St. Catherine's and introduced him to Harriet Tubman. When the newly installed President Andrew Johnson personally wrote me a note for me to travel safely in Tennessee after the war. When in 1866, 1868, I became a bishop in my beloved AME Zion Church. And I became the first black man here in Onondaga County to serve on the grand jury. When during the dark days of slavery, my home yonder on Genesee Street was a refuge for some 1,500 men, women, and children escaping from the tyranny of God and seeking freedom and justice in the North. And the Lord, the Lord may say, the Lord may say, servant, well done. But as I look back over my life today, this evening, I tell each and every one of you that as important to our city, our state, perhaps even our nation, some of the aforementioned incidences and events might have been, it has always been my family and my friends and serving my enslaved kinsmen that mattered most to me. I was separated from my mother and siblings in Tennessee for over 30 years because of that abomination known as slavery. The good citizens of Cortland had attempted to purchase my mother's freedom for me in 44, but to no avail. After the war, I traveled to Tennessee, the state of my childhood bond, and I was reunited with my mother. She was aged and infirm. But she said that she recognized me by the scars on my forehead and by my walk. The scars on my forehead and by my walk. My mother traveled to Nashville to hear me preach to over 2,000 black and white citizens on the celebration of the 4th of July in 1865. To be able to touch my mother, hold her, hear her and cry with her for those few days lifted my spirits and made me fall to my knees in thanksgiving to God. As I look back over my life, I could have done nothing. I would have been nothing.
without the support and guidance and the love of my wife of 27 years, Caroline Elizabeth Logan. It was Caroline who more times than me answered the knock at midnight on our door, who tended to the sick and weary traveler and nursed them to help when I was home and when I was away. It was Caroline who gave birth to our eight children, who maintained our home and was my rock when the winds of hate and controversy threatened to lay me low. When Caroline passed on to glory in 67, it was as if a part of me was taken away with her. No true father makes distinctions between their children, as they are all gifts from God, and all are beautiful in their own ways. But I have to confess to you this evening, I have been blessed to have another rock that I can always depend upon, my daughter, Helen Amelia. When our oldest child, Elizabeth, died in 55, Mia was only 12 years old. But from a young age, she loved education. She loved to help her mother tend to the escaping slaves. And when she became a woman, she fell in love with that veteran of the 54th Massachusetts, Lewis Henry Douglas, the oldest son of Frederick and Anna Douglas. It was one of the proudest moments of my life when Amelia and Lewis Henry were joined in holy matrimony in my home just three years ago in October. If I don't get another chance, I want to tell all of my children, Amelia, Garrett, Sarah, Jermaine, Coral, and Mary, that I love you all. And if your father is not with you, you must look after each other. Never forget to behave like brothers and sisters. My long-standing friendships with John Thomas, Susan B. Anthony, Samuel May, Frederick Douglass, and that model man, Garrett Smith, naming only a few, have meant more to me than I can ever tell. It is truly steadfast friendship that endures to the end. I fear I have worried all of you in attendance this evening too long. Hmm. That the ramblings of an old sick man might not much, not might not mean much in these modern times in which we live. I had leave within the week for Saratoga Springs for the mineral water cure. I had made my peace with God and left all things in his hands. Whatever the outcome of this trip, my mind is at peace and my soul is satisfied. If you in attendance this evening take nothing more from my remarks than this, please remember these words. Each of us is writing a book, whether we will to do it or not. And like my friend, Father Henson, I pray that when I stand before my Creator and the Lord of the heavens and the depths opens up the book of life before me, he will find my name etched in his pages. And he will say to me, come in, Brother Lord, and take your rest. I find no fault in you. May God keep you and may God bless you in the hearing.